Hey y'all, you know what time it is. Woo! Get into it! Get into it! Yes! Come and get your life. <laughs> How is everybody doing? I'm making sure that we're not going to have any phone interruptions. It is a distinctively chilly day here in Yellow Springs, Ohio. It has dropped down to 64, 62. Um... Which is rather interesting because we've had 80 degree weather Friday and, well, actually Monday through Friday has been really nice, but it's been super humid. And anytime, kids, fun fact, when the earth gets to a certain level of heat and humidity, those are the perfect ingredients for the perfect storm. Because when you have a cold front and a massive heat front collide with each other it does create precipitation storms thunderstorms you'll see different clouds nimbo cumulus converging to make the reaction for lightning and thunder and um storms to occur which fun fact you always see lightning before you hear the thunderclap remember that and lightning does not strike in the same place twice And we are back. So we're back with House Moving Castle. And like always, I have to clean my glasses because they're constantly filthy, which I'm due for new glasses. I've had these for two years. So yeah, it's definitely time for me to get a new exam. Um, but we are back. And the last time we left off of the story is that Howl ended up getting a cold. trying to find Prince Justin for the king. And also, his teacher, Mrs. Pinstemon, has been murdered by the Witch of the Waste. And now, we're going to see what happens next, because her funeral is coming up. So, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Oh. Love this bookmark. Be humble, for you are made of earth. Be bulk, be noble, for you are made of the stars. Love that quote. And we're at chapter 15, y'all. This only has 21 chapters, so we're pretty much about 60% done with the book. So we'll be finishing this up fairly soon, and then we'll switch over to Kiki's Delivery Service, which I have behind me. Ugh. Okay, there we go. Bow! Yes, that'll be our next book. Which I'm still on the search to try to find um, Studio Ghibli movies that are based on novels to read for Facebook's Storytime with Chris. So that's why I'm having too much light because I'm being flooded by my window. Hold on. There we go. Now we can see me to a point. Chapter 15. In which Howl goes to a funeral in disguise. The dog man curled up heavily on Sophie's toes when she went back to her sewing. Perhaps he was hoping she would manage to lift the spell if he stayed close to her. Which apparently Sophie has magical abilities, apparently for Miss Penstetta, so we'll see. Hence why the book tends to be better than the movie. No shade to Howl's Moving Castle. The movie by Hayao Miyazaki. It is an it's an incredible film. It was like one of the major anime films that me and my youngest brother Kyle really connected with um, as siblings. So, I mean, we used to quote it all the time, and we still do to a point. But still, How's Moon Castle, the movie is great. But the book just adds more layers and details for certain characters. <laughs> anyway. When a big red bearded man burst into the room carrying a box of things and shed his velvet cloak to become Michael, still carrying a box of things, the dog man rose up and wagged his tail. He let Michael pat him and rub his ears. I hope he stays, Michael said. I've always wanted a dog. Hal heard Michael's voice. He arrived downstairs wrapped in the brown patchwork cover of his bed. Sophie stopped sewing and took a careful grip on the dog, but the dog was courteous to Hal too. He did not object when Hal fetched a hand out of the coverlet and patted him. Well, Hal croaked, dispersing clouds of dust as he conjured some more tissues. I got everything, said Michael, and there's a real piece of luck, Hal. There's an empty shop for sale down at Market Chipping. It used to be a hat shop. Do you think we could move the castle there? 
Hal sat on a tall stool with a robed Roman, like a robed Roman senator and considered. It depends on how much it costs, he said. I'm quite tempted to move the Port Haven entrance there. That won't be easy because it will be mean moving Calcifer. Port Haven is where Calcifer actually is. What do you say, Calcifer? It'll take a very careful operation to move me, Calcifer said. He had become several shades paler at the thought. I think you should leave me where I am. So Fanny is selling the shop, Sophie thought as the other three went on discussing the move. And so much for the conscience Hal said he had. But the main thing on her mind was the puzzling behavior of the dog. In spite of Sophie telling him many times that she could not take the spell off him, he did not seem to want to leave. He did not want to bite Hal. He let Michael take him for a run on Port Haven Marshes that night and the following morning. His aim seemed to become part of the household. Though if I were you, I'd be in upper folding, making sure to catch Letty on the rebound, Sophie told him. Hal was in and out of bed all the next day. When he was in bed, Michael had to tear up and down the stairs. Tear up and down the stairs. He's not crying up and down the stairs. Like, <laughs> He's not doing that. When he was up, Michael had to race about measuring the castle with him and fixing metal brackets to every single corner. Between, Hal kept appearing robed in his quilt and clouds of dust to ask questions and make announcements, mostly for Sophie's benefit. Sophie, since you whitewashed over all the marks we made when we invented the castle, perhaps you can tell me where the marks in Michael's room were. No, said Sophie, sewing in her 17th blues triangle. I can't. Hal sneezed sadly and retired. Surely he emerged again. Sophie, if we were to take that hat shop, what will we sell? Sophie found she had had enough of hats to last a lifetime. Not hats, she said. You can buy the shop and not the business, you know. Apply your fiendish mind to the matter, said Hal, or even think, if you know how. He marched away upstairs again. Five minutes later down, he came again. Sophie, have you any preferences about the other entrances? Where would you like us to live? Sophie instantly found her mind going to Mrs. Fairfax's house. I like a nice house with lots of flowers, she said. I see, croaked Hal and marched away again. Next time he appeared, he was dressed. That made three times that day, and Sophie thought nothing of it until Hal put on the velvet cloak Michael had used and became a pale, coughing, red-bearded man with a large red handkerchief held to his nose. She realized Hal was going out again. You'll make your cold worse, she said. I shall die, and then you'll all be sorry, the red-bearded man said, and he went out through the door with the knob green down. For an hour after that, Michael had time to work on his spell. Sophie got as far as her 84th blue triangle. Then the red-bearded man was back again. He shed the velvet cloak and became a howl, coughing harder than before, and if this was possible, more sorry for himself than ever. I took the shop, he told Michael. It's got a useful shed at the back and a house on the side. I took the lot. I'm not sure what I shall pay for it all with, though. What about the money you get if you find Prince Justin? You forget, croaked Hal. The whole object of this operation is to not look for Prince Justin. We're going to vanish. And he went coughing upstairs to bed, where he shortly began shaking the beams, sneezing for attention again. Michael had to leave the spell and rush upstairs. Sophie might have gone, except the dog man got in the way when she tried. This was another part of his odd behavior. He did not like Sophie to do anything for Hal. Sophie felt this was fairly reasonable. She began her, her 85th triangle. Because she's sewing Hal's uh, blue and gray suit jacket back together because she used it to... Um... Oh gosh, details, details, details. It was falling apart, so she was using it for other purposes. But she's sewing it back together for Hal because he really likes that suit. And his other red and scarlet suit is... Scarlet and gray suit is just falling apart. It's always good, y'all, to make sure with your clothes to use them up as much as possible. Not everybody needs a new outfit all the time. There are probably clothes in your closet right now. Shirts and dresses and blouses and t-shirts and pants and shorts that you haven't worn in a long time that you could definitely wear. You just don't do it um, and would rather try to buy a new outfit. Just 
go back into the closet, go back to the drawing board, use that creative mind, and utilize what we have. And then if you've used everything, then go buy that new outfit. Just saying. <laughs> Michael came cheerfully down and worked on his spell again. He was so happy that he was joining in Calcifer's saucepan song and chanting to the skull just as Sophie did while he worked. We're going to live in market chipping, he told the skull, and I can go and see my letty every day. Is that why you don't howl about the shop? Sophie asked, threading her needle. By this time, she was on her 89th triangle. Yes, Michael said happily. Letty told me about it when we were wondering how we ever see one another again. I told her. He was interrupted by Hal trailing downstairs in his quilt again. This is positively my last appearance, Hal croaked. I forgot to say that Mrs. Pitstubman is being buried tomorrow on her estate near Port Haven, and I shall need the suit cleaned. He brought the grand scarlet suit out from inside his coverlet and dropped it on Sophie's lap. You're attending to the wrong suit, he told Sophie. This is the one I like, but I have the energy to clean it myself. You don't need to go to the funeral, do you? Michael said anxiously. I wouldn't dream of staying in the way, said Hal. Mrs. Pitstubbin may be the wizard I am. I have to pay my respects. But your cold's worse, said Michael. He's made it worse, said Sophie, by getting up and chasing around. Hal at once put on his noblest expression. I'll be all right, he croaked. Oh, excuse me. And as long as I keep out of the sea wind... It's a bitter place, the Pitstubbin estate. The trees are all bent sideways, and there's no shelter for miles. Sophie knew he was just playing for sympathy. She snorted. And what about the witch? Michael asked. Hal coughed piteously. I shall go in disguise, probably as another corpse, he said, trailing back toward the stairs. Then you need a winding sheet and not this suit, Sophie called after him. Hal trailed away upstairs without answering, and Sophie did not protest. She now had the charm suit in her hands, and it was too good a chance to miss. She took up her scissors and hacked the gray and scarlet suit into seven jagged pieces. That ought to discourage Hal from wearing it. Then she got to work on the last triangles of the blue and silver suit, mostly little fragments from around the neck. It was now very small indeed. It looked as if it might be a size too small even for Mrs. Pinsterman's page boy. Michael, she said, hurry up with that spell. It's urgent. I will be long now, Michael said. Half an hour later, he checked things off on his list and said he thought he was ready. He came over to Sophie carrying a tiny bowl with a very small amount of green powder in the bottom. Where do you want it? Here, said Sophie, snipping off the last threads. She pushed the sleeping dog man aside and laid the child-sized suit carefully on the floor. Michael, quite as carefully, tipped the bowl and sprinkled powder on every inch of it. Then they both waited, rather anxiously. A moment passed. Michael sighed with relief. The suit was gently spreading out larger. They watched it spread and spread until one side of it piled up against the dog bed and Sophie had to pull it further away to give it room. After five minutes, they both agreed that the suit looked Hal's size again. Michael gathered it up and carefully shook the excess powder off into the grate. Casper flared and snarled. The dog bed jumped in his sleep. Watch it, said Casper. That was strong. Sophie took the suit and hobbled upstairs on tiptoe with it. Hal was asleep on his gray pillows with his spiders busily making new webs around him. He looked noble and sad in his sleep. Sophie hobbled to put the blue and silver suit on the old chest by the window, trying to tell herself that the suit had got no larger since she picked it up. Still, if it stops you going to the funeral, that's no loss, she murmured as she took a look out the window. The sun was low across the neat garden. A large, dark man was out there, enthusiastically throwing a red ball towards Hal's nephew, Neil, who was standing with a look of patient suffering, holding a bat. Sophie could see the man was Neil's father. Snooping again, Hal said suddenly behind her. Sophie swung around guiltily to find that Hal was only half awake, really. He may even have thought it was the day before because he said, Teach me to keep her envy stinging. <sighs> That's all part of past years now. I love Wales, but it doesn't love me. Megan's full of envy because she's respectable and I'm not. Then he woke up a little more and asked, what are you doing? Just putting out your suit for you, Sophie said and hobbled hastily away. Hal must have gone back to sleep. He did not emerge again that night, and there was no sign of him stirring when Sophie and Michael got up next morning. They were careful not to disturb him. Neither of them felt that going to Mrs. Penstemon's funeral was a good idea. Michael crept out of the hills to take the dog man for a walk. 
Sophie tiptoed about getting breakfast, hoping Howell would oversleep. There was still no sign of Howell when Michael came back. The dog man was starving hungry. Sophie and Michael were hunting in the closet for things a dog could eat when they heard Howell coming slowly downstairs. Sophie! Howell's voice said accusingly. He was standing holding the door to the stairs open with an arm that was entirely hidden inside an immense blue and silver sleeve. His feet on the bottom stair were standing inside the top half of a gigantic blue and silver jacket. Howell's other arm did not come anywhere near the other huge sleeve. Sophie could see that arm in outline, making bulging gestures under a vast frill of collar. Behind Howell, the stairs were full of blue and silver suit trailing back all the way to his bedroom. Oh dear, said Michael. Hal, it was my fault. I... Your fault? Garbage, said Hal. I can detect Sophie's hand a mile off. And there are several miles of this suit. Sophie, dear, where's my other suit? Sophie hurriedly fetched the pieces of the gray and scarlet suit out of the broom cupboard where she had hidden them. Hal surveyed them. Well, that's something, he said. I had been expecting it to be too small to see. Give it here, all seven of it. Sophie held the bundle of gray and scarlet cloth out toward him. Hal, with a bit of searching, succeeded in finding his hand inside the multiple folds of blue and silver sleeve and worked it through a gap between two tremendous stitches. He grabbed the bundle off of her. I am now, he said, going to get ready for the funeral. Please, both of you, refrain from doing anything whatsoever while I do. I can tell Sophie is in top form at the moment. I want this room the usual size when I come back into it. He set off with dignity to the bathroom, waiting in blue and silver suit. The rest of the blue and silver suit followed him, dragging step by step down the stairs and rustling across the floor. By the time Hal was in the bathroom, most of the jacket was on the ground floor and the trousers were appearing on the stairs. Hal half shut the bathroom door and seemed to go on hauling the suit in hand over hand. Sophie and Michael and the dog men stood and watched yard after yard of blue or silver fabric proceed across the floor, decorated with an occasional silver button the size of a millstone and enormous regular rope-like stitches. There may have been nearly a mile of it. I don't think I got that spell quite right, Michael said, when the last huge scalloped edge had disappeared around the bathroom door. And did he let you know it, said Calcifer. Another log, please, Michael gave Calcifer a log. Sophie fed the dog man, but neither of them dared to do anything much else except stand around eating bread and honey for breakfast until Hal came out of the bathroom. He came forth two hours later out of a steam of verbena-scented spells. He was all in black. His suit was black, his boots were black, and his hair was black too. The same blue raven black as Miss Angoria's. His earring was a long jet pendant. Sophie wondered if the black hair was in honor of Mrs. Pentstemon. She agreed with Mrs. Pentstemon that black hair suited Howl. His green glass eyes went better with it. But she wondered very much which suit the black one really was. Hal conjured himself a black tissue and blew his nose on it. The window rattled. He picked up one of the slices of bread and honey from the bench and beckoned the dogman. The dogman looked dubious. I only want you where I can look at you. Hal croaked. His cold was still bad. Come here, pooch. As the dog crawled reluctantly into the middle of the room, Hal added, You won't find my other suit in the bathroom, Mrs. Snoop. You're not getting your hands on any of my clothes again. Sophie stopped tiptoeing toward the bathroom and watched Hal walk around the dog man, eating bread and honey and blowing his nose by turns. What do you think of this as a disguise, he said, and flicked the blue tissue at Calcifer and started to fall forward onto hands and knees. Almost as he started to move, he was gone. By the time he touched the floor, he was a curly red setter, just like the dog man. The dogman was taken completely by surprise, and his instincts got the better of him. His hackles came up, his ears lowered, and he growled. <laughs> Howl played up, or else he felt the same. The two identical dogs walked around one another, glaring, growling, bristling, and getting ready to fight. Sophie caught the tail of the one she thought was the dogman. Michael grabbed for the one he thought was Howl. Howl rather hastily turned himself back. Sophie found a tall black per black person standing up in front of her and let go of the back of Hal's jacket. The dog man sat down on Michael's feet, staring tragically. Good, said Hal. If I can deceive another dog, I can fool everyone else. No one at the funeral is going to notice a stray dog lifting its leg against the gravestones. He went to the door and turned the knob blue down. Wait a moment, said Sophie. If you're going to the funeral as a red setter, why take all the trouble of getting yourself up in black? 
Hal lifted his chin and looked noble. Respect to Mrs. Pinston, he said, opening the door. She liked one to think of all the details. He went out into the street of Port Haven. And that is where we will end for tonight. Thank you all so very much for joining me for Storytime with Chris. Like I said, you do not have to watch these videos when they go live. Please go to the YouTube channel. It's linked in my bio on Facebook as well as Instagram. Like, share, subscribe. It only takes five seconds. I love you all very much. See ya.